So it's it's lovely to see you all. That before I forget, um, the um, there's been a request from the Buddhist Society for you to leave your email addresses if you're willing, and um, Wandu's going to put a, a chat email address in there chat box which will be his email address so if you'd like to make a note of that at some point and then drop him an email with your email address it's a way of uh, collecting a, a, a database because the Buddhist society would quite like to be able to keep in touch and to email people who come to this group at the moment they they have a very sort of scattergun approach they really don't know who comes and um, they'd like to be a bit more targeted with their invites so yeah if you're willing to do that that would be be very nice i don't know whether we've got that in not no, not yet in the chat box but i'm sure one will put that in soon the other thing i was going to say was if you're uh, to bear in mind that um, you can ask questions and uh, I'll beginning with a begin with a chanting and a, a meditation and a, a, a talk but if you would like to give me some questions afterwards that would be really good and you can do that by using the chat or by unmuting yourself when the time comes um, I quite like questions by chat because I can look at them and actually you can send the chat to everybody so that everyone can see your question and um, that's that's quite a nice way of asking questions so uh, I'll begin by chanting the dedication of offerings. I've got a little Buddha Rupa just here that you can't see so when I'm bowing I'm bowing to the little Buddha Rupa that's just behind the screen and the three refuges and the five precepts. I'll do, do that, I'll just share the screen. So if you could make sure you're muted and then you're welcome to join in. To the Blessed One, the Lord who fully attained perfect enlightenment, to the teaching which he expounded so well, and to the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, to these, the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, we render with offerings our rightful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us, the Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one. I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato 
Arahato Sambha Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambhutasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tammang Saranang Gachami Sangham Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Tammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Sangham Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Tammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sangham Saranang Gachami Pānāti pāta vera mani sikā padang samādhyāmi I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Ādhinā dāna vera mani sikā padang samādhyāmi I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara vera mani sikha badang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada vera mani sikha badang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura miriamadja pramadatana. Vera mani sikha badang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikha badani. Silena sugating yanti. Silena bogasampada. Silena nibuting yanti tasma silang pisodaye. These are the five precepts. Virtue is a source of happiness. Virtue is the source of true wealth. Virtue is the source of peacefulness. Therefore, let virtue be purified. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So if you can make yourselves comfortable, find a suitable way to sit. Establishing uh, the suitable conditions for the mind to calm down is 
uh, it's why we take the five precepts because when we establish morality the hindrances fall away establishing a wholesome thought laying aside the unwholesome so setting, creating the right conditions for the mind to calm down it's more about establishing an inner those conditions within rather than having the perfect conditions externally if we haven't the mind's not consumed with remorse for having done some, some something unwholesome then the mind's able to calm down quite naturally so we establish the five precepts as a foundation before we meditate We take the three refuges so that our minds will incline towards Nibbana. The Buddha represents Nibbana. So when we take refuge in the Buddha, we incline towards Nibbana. We, that's our, our goal. as a wholesome aspiration but that's not a, a grasping but simply a, a sense of direction as though you were on a journey not grasping the destination but simply heading in the right direction knowing that it's in this this is the direction of travel and that, that means we're inclining towards letting go because what precedes nibbana is a willingness to let go Letting go is the opposite of grasping. So, 
establishing an upright posture is, and to be mindful of that, to notice the experience of sitting means we need to step back a little just to notice to step back from the experience we need to is a, a letting go of the grasping mind we simply notice this is the upright posture so give attention to that to to the body sitting upright how is that how would that be bringing back the shoulders straightening the spine finding a point of balance not trying to be super meditator but simply to let go into the body to give attention to the upright posture to let go of the busy mind so that we can notice how the body is when we notice how the body is we may notice areas of tension in the body and unclenching those tense areas is a way of letting go just to relax sometimes it's just helpful to be consciously aware of tension in the body and, and deliberately release it give it permission to relax let go may be used to meditation object perhaps focusing on the breath for example and if if you do let go of any sense of of a goal that you're going to something to achieve out of that to simply breathe take one breath at a time and notice that leave one inhalation one exhalation that's good enough to be aware of not trying to get anything out of it just to do it notice that meditation object inhalation exhalation whatever object arises in the mind uh, 
whatever sense base, through whatever sense base, whatever object, you can notice it. Well, that's a mental object. This is the sound. Whatever it is. If you're coming back to the breath just to notice that sound, that's the mind, busy, the busy mind. It can be useful to know, know what it is. In fact, with mindfulness always comes the capacity to know what it is. That's the anxiety. That's restlessness, whatever it is. To know it and let it go. Letting go is always available to us, whatever it is. Sometimes things stick around, they're quite strong and insistent. Maybe it's a physical pain or 
maybe it's a, an emotion that's a powerful emotion you can just uh, you know letting go just seems especially of the things that we don't like we can try to get rid of them through letting go and that's not the right way the right way is to allow to let things be to let the things we don't want be the pain in the foot or letting it go to get rid of it we're letting go of our resistance allowing it in get an emotional state we can let go of the story but the emotion we have to let it wear out let it wear away let it disappear of its own accord when we let go of the story the, we're not creating the emotion anymore but we can observe it and watch it cease in its own time then we'll understand it the breaths always available to return to just taking one inhalation and one exhalation The Buddha described a simile of like a water flowing down a stream into a river. It's inclining downhill, isn't it? Letting go. The 
river flows into this, the ocean finally merges with the salt water taste the salt it's a taste of liberation like that it has a flavour a taste so we incline towards that that taste of liberation taste of freedom the mind calms down we relax start to understand the way things are
coming towards the last five minutes of the meditation. Remembering kindness is the attitude that we need to bring to our practice. So what is being kind to ourselves? What's that like? That's accepting ourselves as we are. Not judging and being self-critical. But to accept. is the greatest kindness. The greatest kindness we can give anyone is to accept them as they are. So to reflect on that radical acceptance, how that attitude can inform your practice. And allow the feeling of loving kindness to fill your heart and have and to be able to extend that loving kindness to all beings. This is this is possible. It begins here.
Alex is saw a question in the in the chat about can I give some tips about how to maintain right attitude? Attitude of acceptance. That's the right attitude. Now, why would that be? So, if you, uh, you know, why is is accepting people as they are the greatest kindness? It's actually, you know, if you if you think about it, um, it, it what would we most want to be? Uh, from what would we most want, uh, find most beneficial, helpful, desirable, if you like, from anyone else would be to be accepted as we are. That's that's a that's the greatest kindness, isn't it? It doesn't mean to say that we're perfect or couldn't do better or something, but. To be accepted as we are is the foundation of a, of any relationship, and so to accept others as they are that's the beginning of that relationship of any relationship. It's the beginning of any dialogue, isn't it? Any communication it has to begin from accepting people as they are. And so that uh, inner, the inner dialogue has to come from that same acceptance. When we listen, look inwardly, if we're critical, self-critical, that's not a good basis for a dialogue. That's just not good enough, should try harder, could do better. That's the, that's what, that's the parent telling the child it's not a communication, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an instruction. It's not a dialogue. And what the, uh, you know, the attitude of accepting is very important in the sense of looking at the first noble truth. So I remember um, when I first came to Buddhism, I, I thought, I don't, I'm not suffering. <laughs> so why, why did the Buddha teach the first noble truth to be there is suffering? I mean, I'm not suffering. I didn't come to Buddhism to, for that and and it was only over time I realized that a very long time I realized the first noble truth needs, needs, is really we need to admit suffering, that we're suffering. We have to admit it that we are because we, we don't want to. Um, at least maybe some people do, but for me I didn't want to admit it. That was the first step. Uh, an acceptance that there was there is suffering, that I'm exper I experienced suffering. I didn't, when I really began to accept that, I realized how much suffering I was experiencing. How painful it was. And really surprised, I was really surprised how much in denial I was of that. But you don't begin a communication with the first noble truth if you're not prepared to admit that, that you're suffering. You can't start, you can't begin, can you? It's, a, it's an instruction. You know, you could take the first noble truth like uh, you ought to be suffering, or <laughs> something like that. Or, but you, you know, that's not it, that's not what it's about. It's about admitting it, you know, to yourself, really investigating and and uh, 
accepting that it's like this it feels like this you know that horrible feeling in the stomach when you've been criticized or something you know like that or you think people are laughing at you you think ah oh. <laughs> and um, and that's suffering isn't it that's dukkha The, that horrible feeling of lacking confidence, self-confidence, when we don't know, we're worried about when we say something, whether or not people are going to be upset. We want to please people. So it's very, we can be very anxious about that. And it's a lot, that's dukkha. Or um, our sense of of uh, the imminence of, of death that you get this pandemic you know we're continually reminded how many people have died today and and the uh, resistance that we might have to hearing that or the anxiety that might cause and that's a that's dukkha that's that's suffering so uh, you know accepting it feels like this this is what it's like this is, this is the first noble truth. It, it, acceptance is the be basis, the right attitude. It couldn't be anything else. Interesting, isn't it, that the acceptance of the first noble truth is the first thing. That's the first step. To admit how bad it is, you know, it's, <laughs> to admit it hurts, is is the first step, and then you know we're not, not trying to make it bad for you or say, you know, it's just um, that uh, just to let go of the pretense is all I'm saying, because then we can investigate where where's where's that coming from? How where why do we? Where's you know how is that? created and we understand the second noble truth as it comes out of desire so we want it to be otherwise so if we, if we can accept it as it is then there is no wanting it to be otherwise it's okay it's like this so again the acceptance underlies the is a sort of attitude, if you like, the underlying attitude to bring to our practice. Because it's admitting it's like it hurts, admitting it's like this, and then and accepting the way it is, rather than creating suffering out of it. There's this, it's, you know, it's as it is, in fact, rather than there is suffering. As time goes on, we start to realize that there's just, it's like this, this that there is experience. And uh, suffering is optional. You know, that the, the experience of discomfort in the body, for example, is one thing, it's one level. Uh, conventionally we call it suffering, but the, the real suffering is our resistance to it, wanting it to be otherwise. And it's the same for emotional pain. Uh, the suffering, the real suffering, suffering that's optional is our resistance to it. It's natural to feel grief in bereavement, for example. But uh, our resistance to it is non-acceptance. Acceptance is to admit, to experience, to experience it fully. If you can experience emotional states fully, you let, you can let them go. Then you just come and go. It's our resistance that that stops that happening, and then. We never get to the end, we never finish emotional states. There's 
they're all they're all always half finished and unfinished we're not seeing them through to the end if you let them to go to their completion if you accept them fully then they just come to a natural cessation just come and go that's the same with you know it's, a, it's true of bereavement if you allow if you accept fully that that experience then it's done with it's fully experienced it's allowed and completely accepted then it, it it's we like we can let it go it can come and go without there's no lasting there's nothing a no unfinished business there it's completely accepted but for most of i mean i would say our lives our lives are very much about unfinished business we have experience a lot of uh, upset a lot of states and upsetting states of mind that we haven't got time to deal with we've just got to get on with it you know just get on with life and and one thing comes after another and we never quite process things to the end so mindfulness is really about the development of that capacity to process things fully so that you begin present uh, in the moment we can uh, accept things and allow them to to run their course you know, fully open to the to the experience I said it it takes time and maybe it's certainly true that our meditation practice can be an opportunity to process unfinished business so I uh, like to encourage people to reflect you know, to use that reflective capacity in meditation too so that when when they uh, when something comes up in meditation maybe it's it's an un, it's unfinished business from earlier in the day something happened you heard that so and so died and at the time you just couldn't you know you had to get on with something else there wasn't time to deal with that you only experienced it partly but not fully then you can call that thought that memory up whether it comes up naturally or whether you just think oh yeah I remember let's just uh, go back to that feeling when that when I was told that person had died and that conversation I had with the person who was bereaved how was that and just to go back and experience that again is can be helpful in meditation just to f process it fully that means opening up and accepting uh, the experience fully and letting it run its course to to the end which means when it's no longer sticks in the mind basically it just loses it finishes of its own accord and there's another moment, you know, you realise, oh, there it is, it's not there now, there's something else. We just gave it the opportunity to teach us what it had to teach, you know, this is the learning opportunity that we have with unpleasant states, that we can allow them in, let them teach us what the we what we have to learn and what we learn is our resistance we learn out of resistance so although we might think oh I, my res I shouldn't be resistant to this or whatever but the resistance is is what we need what we learn from and when we've learned what it has to teach us we haven't got the resistance goes that's the letting go when we let go it's done it's finished the resistance isn't there anymore that means we've learnt what we had to learn and who knows no you 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 don't know until until it happens what it is that you need to learn these things happen and they happen for a reason because we've got something to learn it comes and sticks in the mind you know things that 
Things we don't need to learn from just come and go. They just flow, flow through the mind. But if the, if we've got something to learn, if we, we, it, we need to let it, and it sticks, you know, <laughs> then uh, we need to investigate. What's that about? And with this way of investigation, which is not believing the answer, in the, the, the what's that about question may throw up an answer, but we don't believe it. We just keep on investigating. So it's quite, I find a useful mantra is not sure. Are you sure? No, I'm not sure. It, uh, the mind comes up with this answer. No, I'm not sure. Are you sure? No, I'm not sure. So you keep hearing the mind might tell you this is the solution, you know, this is the the reason, this is the cause, but we don't uh, believe it, just keep on investigating. And, and then you'll find maybe a deeper cause. Uh, the first thing you think of is often just the conditioned way of thinking you you that's the, probably coming out of repression you you know you're just conditioned to repress with that that solution that's the easy solution that you've learnt over the past that was a way of suppressing and resist and, and denying but so we don't believe that we just are you sure no, I'm not sure. You, when you investigate, you can let go of the easy, the first thing you think of, and go deeper. What is it, really? What's underlying this? Until you could dig down, and eventually you let go, and you get to what underlies everything is fear. There's fear there. Somewhere there's fear. So you open up to that. What's that about? Where's that coming from? What is it, really? And so you just let go, like I'm peeling an onion, and gradually it disappears to nothing. There's nothing there. Because in the end there's nothing there. There's no, no one, in a sense. There's no resistance. There's no, there's no, there's no substance to the resistance. There's no one there to, to hold on, to be the one who resists. Eventually there's nothing there. There's the thing it's just acceptance of the way things are. It's just like this. So anyway, I uh, um I'll just reread this question. Uh, we Martin, we said hello at the beginning and I immediately started to say about how difficult I found Zoom. Reflecting on this I I reminded myself about the need to be positive at all times as a basis for right attitude on the Eightfold Path. Can you give us some practical tips about how to maintain right attitude? Hmm. And, um, yeah, I didn't talk about being positive at all times, did I? I talked about acceptance. I think Positive at all times can be a a, a, te a, 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 um, a denial. It can be a way of pushing away reality. It sounds good, you know. And I know lots of self-help books around about positive thinking, and it is it's very nice. I'm, you know, I'm mean, all in favour of smile therapy. You know, it's great, but there's a certain denial in it. Because it can be, um, you know, the world isn't like that. It, it, we're made up of, it's happy and sad. It's made up of, there are both sides. And there are some things you can't be positive about. <laughs> there's, there's, you know, you can't find a positive spin. And it's, it, we don't have to be. The wonderful thing is, it's okay to suffer. Dukkha's, you know, the Buddha's wonderful. The core of the Buddha's teaching is suffering is natural. Positivity, we don't have to be positive at all times. 
it's okay to feel negative because that's how it is. is that there are things about which feeling negative is an appropriate response. <laughs> you know? Why would it be? Why would you feel positive um, about bereavement? What's positive about that? And people, and you know, I had this conversation today. It was, this, this, you know, five o'clock I got this message about somebody had died and I rang up my friend. And I talked to his wife, and it says well, his wife's father had died. And the conversation was, well, you know, all about how can we put a positive spin on this? That, or, you know, the, it was, he was really, it was a release. Um, you know, it, it, almost like it, it, it was good it didn't happen over Christmas. You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can re create a positive positivity i mean I, I don't that was understandable but actually we don't have to be positive about bereavement it's okay to feel that you know to really go into how does that feel uh you know this is a way of of, of this positivity is a way of denying that experience the experience of bereavement Oh well, it was, you know, perhaps it was for the best. <laughs> but the experience of losing your, someone you love is is not positive. Well, it's not. It doesn't have to be positive. It can be. It's however it is. It's to fully experience it how it is. It's so that there's nothing left. So it's experienced to its conclusion, to the end, then that's positive. That's the, that is positive because there's nothing left. It's okay. There's no resistance there. Has anyone get, else got any questions? Don't have to put them into chat. I'm going to have to invent some questions if you don't come up with something. I, I can uh, bring up something. Uh, there is plenty of opportunities uh, for uh, solitude these days. Uh, can you say something about it? For solitude? And being uh, in the lockdown, do you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there are, aren't there? Um, especially if, if you're on your own, because I wish I, I'm, I'm not, but I can understand that 
especially when people are on their own, there must be a lot of opportunities for solitude. That's why Zoom is so wonderful, isn't it? Getting together with with people. So um, I, I've found it very useful to form the, the Zoom, different Zoom groups, a uh, little morning meditation group with some friends, and uh, of course the evening meetings like this with a few different groups. As a wonderful way of, of getting together with Dhamma friends, good friends, and 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 to discuss Dhamma, to practice Dhamma. And it's been, from that point of view, a wonderful experience over the pandemic to be able to practice. To I've, I've really felt it benef incredibly beneficial. I think also the. Um, the being able, the, the the situations being useful from the point of view of reflecting on death, I've really found that useful. So that uh, it's been very much in in your face, hasn't it? The, every time you you if you notice every time you notice you, a sore throat, you think, oh, is that what's that about? You know, <laughs> what's happening? Um, and and it reminds you, doesn't it that there's this pandemic and uh, people dying, and that's wonderful to for practice. Wonderful opportunity to practice and to bring that reflection of uh, our imminent death. And of course, we don't know when then that will be. I mean, relatively, in the in the in the bigger scheme of things, life, uh, you know, it, our deaths death is imminent. We've no idea when it will be, but in the overall scheme of things it's relative. You know, we could say uh, it's imminent. We just don't know when. So every time we breathe, we don't really don't know, do we? When we um, as we kind of plan our holidays, you know, if, if you've got any holidays planned, and you've no idea whether or not you're going to take them. This is wonderful. This is the, you know, good reflection on the Nietzsche. Everything's uncertain, and, and really, we don't know. So, that can be a, a, a cause of stress, can't it? I think the something that's very, can become very clear to me is how a Nietzsche, the uh, impermanence of things, is the and the uncertainty of everything, is probably the great cause, the greatest cause of stress during the pandemic. And why would that be? It's because of we we don't want it to be that way. We want certainty. We want permanence. We don't want uncertainty and impermanence, and so we create suffering out of that. But we don't need to. You know, we can reflect. So using the capacity to reflect, what's that about? Where, why, why, you know, why am I creating suffering? Where's that coming from? It's coming ultimately as we pare back the, the first thing we think of, the first reason we come up with. And as we pare it back, we discover, oh, I'm, I can't, you know, I, I just want to have everything certain. I just want to be on, to get it everything. If I just be sure, you know, be, if I could just be sure about everything, something, anything. I just, that sense of uncertainty is a sense of losing control. And I just desperately want to have everything under control. And in, because if I haven't got control, then what it, you know, then, and, the, and nothing certain, then um, I might, you know, then uh, that's um, frightening, isn't it? But but it isn't really frightening. It it's just the way it is. If you can accept it the way as it is, then there's nothing to, no fear there. But when we pair, so as we pair back that 
sense, you know, if you feel anxiety, is we investigate what's that, accept it. First of all, we have to accept dukkha. So first of all, we accept it's like this. Then we start to pair, pair back, where is it coming from? What's the origin of that? How's it arising? Not believing in the answer until we, until the, until it's revealed its truth to us. And we'll know that. We'll know when you've, when we know the truth, when we, when it, when we can let it go. So we let it go bit by bit, and then, when it's finished, we'll know. We're left with knowing. That's what we're left with. There's nothing left. Everything disintegrates. There's nothing substantial. But we're left with knowing. We know how it is. We know that's that. It's like this. Mm. I've often um, said to people that letting go and and uh, acceptance is not about destroying anything. And, and one of the misunderstandings that uh, often people have about anatta, for example, not self, is that uh, it's about destroying. You know, we've got to get rid of the self. And sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, I really like the idea of not self because I don't like myself. So. I, I, you know, it's great, you know, to get rid. I don't. Uh, I, uh, that it's great to hear that uh, I don't exist. So that uh, is. It's not about. It's not what the Buddha meant at all. In fact, the acceptance applies to that to the self too. We have to accept ourselves completely. In order to understand, so. Anicca, an anatta, I mean, not self, is is a, an understanding of the self. It's a letting go through understanding. And first, we have to admit, you know, I, I, I'm, this is how it feels. My, the self is like this. If you if you hold an idea that the there's no self and you hit, keep hitting it over the head every time the, the self emerges and hit it over the head with this view, this fixed view that there is no self, then you'll never get to know it. You'll never get to investigate it. The, the way to investigate and to, and to let go of the self is to allow it to fully manifest, to allow it in completely. And that means to accept. So we... You know, when I talked about accepting the greatest kindness to us is to accept ourselves as we are, well, that means to accept. Exactly, exactly you know, you can't suppress or turn away or pretend uh, that we don't have a self. We just have to open up to it completely and, and open it and, and accept it. That's the way to let it in so that we can investigate it and understand because the self manifests, of course, in many different ways. So, uh, as you open up with self compassion, self forgiveness, if you like, whatever, as you allow in, uh, allow everything to reveal itself, you find that, you know, the, the suppressed and, and repressed little cells in ourselves start to come up. This is wonderful in meditation. The little traumas, the little tantrums that we've had that haven't been fully uh, understood in the past can come up. And if you can accept them, they'll manifest and then you can see as they are. See, you know, when you see things, you realize the funny side of them. Actually, <laughs> you you realize how how strange it is, but also how sad that you've felt that you couldn't, you know, you, through non-acceptance, you had to suppress these things, these little unfinished, it's all unfinished. So then when we allow it to, to complete, to go to its to com completion, 
This is this is the self dis disintegrates. There's nothing there. You realise there's nothing there. There was nothing there. There was never anything there. It's all a creation. But well, we re because we repressed repressed it, we weren't couldn't investigate it. So that I think uh, acceptance is really the key to accept to seeing, realising the truth. You have to open up and allow everything in. And that's what mindfulness is. It's a and it is, uh, it's about um, not um, it's about it's, it's a broad widening of of our attention so that to uh, open to everything whatever it is is this is what mindfulness is we're not saying with mindfulness what the object should be that is in meditation you can talk about using the breath, but really, we're just allowing everything. We're not judging anything. It, whatever arises, is is that's the moment. That's what's in the present moment. We're not saying it shouldn't be this way. We're saying it's 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 we're accepted. Acceptance is an essential part of mindfulness practice. If you couldn't, if you can't accept things, then you'll you won't allow them in. So that is, there's no real mindful. That's not the practice of mindfulness, is it? The practice of mindfulness is opening up, allowing, and allowing everything. And then because of that, because we have that attitude of allowing, of acceptance, which enables everything to come in, then we can investigate it, you know, we can investigate it then. So mindfulness, sati sampajanu come together, there's mindfulness and then clearly seeing. So mindfulness, the point of mindfulness is not, it's not nice, it's not just about enjoying the blue sky and, and the f pretty flowers, it's about the capacity to investigate. You know, we're opening up so that we can investigate and, and learn, and that's where the change of attitude comes. That's where the the that's where the uh, shift of attitude arises, which we call insight. That's where it comes from. It's a shift of attitude and seeing things from a different perspective. That that's what um, trans is transformative. That's what changes your life. Honesty. Uh, it, it's a lovely, I, um, somebody asked a question, can you say something about honesty and the self? I was, um, emailing someone recently around this and um, and I said that um, we were talking about I think they, they were their email was about honesty and I was saying that um, you know asking people to be honest is asking too much you know it's interesting looking at the five precepts that the standard is not to lie and that's really, we can ask we can ask that we can expect that of people not to deliberately lie, and that's a standard that we can live to as well. But to expect them to be honest is asking too much. And why why is that? It's because unless you fully understand yourself, how can you be honest? Uh, you don't know if you don't know if you not if you don't understand. You know you whatever you say is only half true, isn't it? Because you're, it's coming out of delusion, so it can't be completely honest. <laughs> Honesty is about looking, it's about the self, it's about looking inwards. Our responsibility is to be honest with ourselves, not to demand honesty from other people. Can't, that's asking too much, you can't expect that. And if we go around saying, you're feeling let down because people weren't honest, then, then you know, 
what do what what would we expect? How could we expect? As long as if they didn't deliberately lie, we can't really go expect more than that. But what we can do is develop honesty in ourselves, and that's what our practice is to learn to be honest, so that we're we this the path of of admitting how it feels, opening up to the experience, investigating, and un, is a path of understanding. When we understand, then we can be honest. You can, you know, you can be honest because you know. <laughs> You know, so you can be honest. You know, you can speak truthfully, can't you? Because you have that in, in you. You know it, and therefore you can be honest. You can be truthful. But if you don't know, if you don't understand, how can you be truthful? How can you be honest? You can't know. It's only half a truth or a bit of a truth. It's the best you can come up with. It's based on your delusion. So I think the practice of honesty, cultivation of honesty, and the, in ourselves is. It's a development, it's the it's our path of practice, it's an inner honesty. It's honesty with ourselves, it's that first step of admitting how how it feels. Admitting uh, the dukkha, the first noble truth is about admitting it feels how it feels, it feels like this. I think that honesty is fundamental and that's our that's the, our path, and the wonderful thing is when we, as we do develop more clarity of mind, then we do have that ability to be honest. Does that, and then, in conventional terms, uh, does that mean we have to go around telling everyone how it is? No, we we can wait for the right time. We don't have to go around and saying, you know, upsetting everyone. <laughs> But when the right time comes, then we can skillfully speak the truth. And it, uh, it can be beneficial because it's coming from some clarity of mind. So that's interesting, I think, that honesty. It's a really lovely question. Can you say something about honesty and the soul? We are, we can aspire to be honest, and I think we should. Honesty is the most wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, uh, honesty infers in life, infers, it's something about communication, isn't it? So it's that inner dialogue, willingness to honestly listen, but not to believe, you know, the critical mind. Not to believe it. Are you sure? No, I'm not sure. Uh, just the inner tyrant speaking. I know, you know, when we understand, then we're not taking in. And then the honesty of speaking our truth. That's wonderful to be able to do that. But to know, we have to know what's true before we can speak it. So it takes, that's an inner, that's the inner practice that we do to develop honesty. So I think we're kind of getting to the end, and I'd like to close with a closing homage. So thank you very much for joining this evening. And don't forget to leave your email address with Wangdu. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. So, over the next uh, three months, January, February, March, that will be Nick and I alternating, more or less, teaching the these uh, Theravada 
uh, meditation group, this group. So do, um, I think you'll probably find it's ne next week, it'll be Nick and it's more or less alternate. So uh, hope to you can join us and look forward to seeing you again.